a spacecraft with iron drives. It looks and sounds like something right from science fiction. And of course it does. In sci-fi, ion engines are used quite frequently, as well as warp drives, photon drives and others. But unlike warp drives, which might be only hypothetically possible and we don't know whether it will ever be built, ion drives are not only possible, they have actually been in use for decades. I've made several videos about space engines. The first in the series was a video about the M drive, which is impossible in principle. And ion drives are the opposite of that. When I opened up the astrophysical database to look for papers on this topic, I found thousands of studies, so I decided to include not only ion drives. Now I'm gonna talk not only about ion thrusters, but about electric propulsion in general. Let's talk about how they work, what's good about them and how different they are from conventional chemical engines, and about a lot more. My name is Andrzej and this is Cosmos Elementary. In the previous video I said that on the one hand ion drives had very weak thrust and on the other hand they were really efficient. They produced thrust for years and require less fuel. So what's so special about ion drives? Well, the name sounds futuristic, but there is no warping of space-time, antimatter, nothing like that. Boring. Mm, no, it's not, especially because this is what works here and now. But how are ion drives different from regular chemical drives and what do they have in common? Firstly, they both use the same fundamental principles, which are the Newton's third law and conservation of momentum. I had a little demonstration of that in my video on M drive. I threw some weight in one direction and started moving in the opposite one. The most overused demonstration is with the balloon. The air is coming out one way and the balloon is flying the other way. Basically, if some object exhausts mass in one direction, it escapes the system, this object starts moving in the opposite direction, if other forces don't interfere. And the same principle works in case of both chemical and ion engines. They both expel material to accelerate, but then differences begin. In the case of chemical rockets, thrust is produced via chemical reactions. Basically, the fuel burns out and the gas under high pressure and temperature is exhausted through the nozzle. Gas is the propellant. This is just the basics. And also, there are different types of chemical engines. There are rockets with liquid propellant. They can be monopropellant and bipropellant where fuel and oxidizer are separated. Oxidizer is necessary for fuel to be able to burn. Which is kind of important. Sure, on Earth, where there is plenty of oxygen around, we can light a match and it will burn. But in space, we need to bring our own oxidizer. That's a simplified version. Here's fuel, here's oxidizer. They go here into a combustion chamber where reaction has to start via ignition and then the resulting gas is exhausted through the nozzle in this direction. And the rocket goes in the opposite direction. The advantage is that you could turn such an engine off. It doesn't have to burn everything at once. And also those engines have relatively high exhaust velocity. But those systems are more complicated and it's more difficult to work with liquid fuels. There are also monopropellant engines where oxidizer is basically mixed with fuel. The other type is solid propellant engines where fuel is, well, in solid form and also mixed with oxidizer. It's easier to store, but normally you wouldn't be able to turn such an engine off. If the reaction starts, it goes all the way until there is no fuel left. Also, there are hybrid systems. Many modern rockets use liquid fuel with separate oxidizers. But why do I even talk about all this if the topic is ion drives? Well, to demonstrate what are the main differences. Remember I said that ion thrusters are much more efficient and require less fuel. So we've got a chemical rocket all fueled up and all of the energy for acceleration is in chemical bonds of material in the rocket's tanks. We are limited by the mass of the fuel, the design of the rocket and properties of chemical reactions. In the case of chemical rockets, the exhaust velocity is usually about 4 km per second. Everything we need to accelerate the propellant and hence the rocket itself is on the rocket. But in the case of iron and other types of electric thrusters, the energy source used to accelerate the propellant can be not on a spacecraft. 
For instance, the Sun is such a source. A spacecraft can have solar panels, but also the energy source can be internal, like uh, reacts are on board. In the case of electric engines, the exhaust velocity can be much higher, 10 to 20 or even up to 40 km per second. But the amount of the exhausted material per unit time is smaller. So the chemical rocket expels a lot of mass in a short period of time. That means high thrust, but the velocity of the propellant is relatively low. But in the same time span, an electric drive would expel less propellant, but its velocity is much higher. Exhaust velocity is higher, but thrust is weaker. But the specific impulse of electric thrusters, which is a parameter that basically describes how efficiently a rocket engine creates thrust, it is higher. In the simplest example, we can imagine two spacecraft, one with a chemical engine and the other with the electric one. And they both have the same small amount of fuel. Let's say a chemical rocket would use all of the fuel up in 10 seconds and accelerate by 4 km per second. Now I'm not using actual values, just some arbitrary ones as an example. But an electric drive would work on the same amount of propellant, let's say for a month. But in the end it would reach 40 km per second. Its specific impulse is higher, and it is more efficient. Again, those are arbitrary values, but you get the point. So, let's talk about types of electric engines. In the book Fundamentals of Electric Propulsion, they are given the following basic description. In general, electric propulsion encompasses any propulsion technology in which electricity is used to increase the propellant exhaust velocity. As I've said, iron thrusters are not the only ones. It's just a subtype of one of the three main types of electric thrusters. Electrothermal thrusters, electrostatic and electromagnetic. Let's tackle them one by one. As you might have guessed from the name, in electrothermal thrusters electricity is used to heat the propellant up, which is then exhausted and that creates thrust. This kind is the most similar to classical chemical engines. In both cases the propellant is accelerated by heating up, and the difference is a heating mechanism. There are also three subtypes of electrothermal thrusters. First type is arc jet. Gas is heated with an electric arc of hundreds of amps. Propellant can get heated up to very high temperatures of thousands of kelvins. So the whole system is made so that ideally propellant doesn't get in contact with the walls of the combustion chamber and a nozzle. Among fuel options is hydrazine, which is also used in conventional chemical rockets. The exhaust velocity is about 5 to 6 km per second, and if ammonia is used up to 9 km per second, but the system becomes more complex in that case. Another type is resistor jet. Here the propellant is heated with the surface of a solid heat exchanger, it could be a coil or the walls of a heating chamber. That's a simple schematic. Here is a propellant feed, here is a heat exchanger, and the heated gas is again exhausted through a nozzle. The fuel also can be hydrogen. In the third type of those engines, the gas is heated up with electromagnetic waves like radio or microwaves. In arc jets, electrodes that create an arc are subjected to erosion, which limits its lifespan and so using radiation instead, this problem can be solved. In general, electrothermal engines suffer from the same problems and limitations of conventional chemical engines, like the maximum possible temperature of the heated propellant limits the exhaust velocity. And yet it is two to three times higher than that of chemical rockets. And electrothermal engines are used, for instance, on satellites in the lower Earth orbit. I myself and perhaps some of you in the past saw this in the sky. An object that looks like a moving star appears in the sky, quickly becomes very bright and then quickly fades away. And it is not a meteor. If you saw something like that, it could have been a satellite flare, specifically a flare of iridium satellites. Those satellites used to reflect sunlight with their antennae while flying over a certain location on Earth. So those satellites had electrothermal engines, resistor jets in fact. They were used for instance for altitude control. But anyway, electrothermal engines are similar to chemical engines. The ones that are more different are the engines of the second type, electrostatic rocket engines. Ion drives belong to that type. As we know, charged particles get attracted and repelled from each other depending on their charges. So, this principle is used in electrostatic thrusters to accelerate particles. They are accelerated by the direct interaction with electrostatic forces. That's a schematic of an ion thruster. Here is an ion source, here they are accelerated and then exhausted from one side which makes the spacecraft move. But 
Also, the exhaust needs to be neutralized. So here we have three main elements. So first we need fuel, and in this case it is different from what is used in chemical rockets. It can be cesium, mercury, argon, krypton, but the most common is xenon. It's a noble gas and it's quite safe and easy to work with and store, and also it has relatively high mass among other noble gases, so it creates more thrust. Gas, in this case xenon, needs to be ionized. It can be achieved by various methods, but one of the most common ones is the method of electron bombardment. Xenon goes into a chamber with a hollow cathode, which is a source of electrons. It works kinda like this. Xenon is supplied into a chamber, green spheres are its neutral atoms. And here is where high-energy electrons come from, those yellow spheres. They obviously have negative charge, then they collide with neutral atoms, and that strips away electrons from those atoms. And the atoms become positively charged xenon ions. Magnets at the walls interact with electrons, making the whole ionization process more efficient. So there is a mix of positively charged xenon ions and negatively charged free electrons, plasma. And it's affected by electric and magnetic fields. And now we need to accelerate those ions. Here are negatively and positively charged grids. When ions go through the holes, they get accelerated in the direction of a negatively charged grid and escape the thruster at the very high velocity of up to 40 km per second, and that creates thrust. So exhaust velocity is the order of magnitude higher than that of chemical engines. But that's not all. I haven't yet said anything about the third component, neutralizer. That's another cathode that releases the stream of electrons in such amounts so that the combined charge of the material leaving the thruster was equal to zero. If you don't do that, the spacecraft itself will over time accumulate charge and begin attracting release ions back to the spacecraft, and that will decrease thrust and also it can erode the spacecraft. So that's the basic principle of electrostatic ion drives. We ionize the gas, accelerate ions with electrostatic forces and then neutralize the stream of particles. The energy source of main systems is not the fuel, but rather the sun or a small nuclear reactor. Another big difference is that, unlike chemical and electrothermal engines, electrostatic ones lack nozzles. The grids are designed in a way to focus the stream of particles and create maximum thrust. There are different kinds of electrostatic thrusters with modified components. Some drives use liquid metal like cesium or mercury's fuel, also, there are colloid thrusters that use non-metallic liquids. And we still have the third type, electromagnetic thrusters. In short, here electric and magnetic fields are used to accelerate gas. Here are some subtypes. Pulsed plasma thrusters, magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters, and of course hole thrusters. In some sources I use it is put into electrostatic category and in others in electromagnetic. We'll not go into detail about this one, perhaps I'll come back to it in future videos. This type of thrusters is also used quite frequently, though its specific impulse is lower, but the thrust is higher. Of course, there is a lot more to each kind of thrusters I talked about, and also there is a lot more kinds. But at least now we can see that ion thruster is just one of many other kinds of electric thrusters. It's no surprise that ion thrusters become more and more popular. It has the highest specific impulse among currently available thrusters and also energy conversion efficiency of up to 80%. I've already mentioned one downside, which is low thrust. For instance, one Raptor engine creates at the sea level about 2 million newtons of thrust. An N-star thruster, Dawn spacecraft, had three of those. So it creates only 91 million newtons of thrust, so it is many orders of magnitude lower. I've seen a video where a NASA engineer, to demonstrate how weak the thrust is, did this. Yeah, that's about what it is. So it's obvious that with such a thrust, there is no way that modern ion thrusters could be used to put spacecraft into space. This is obviously not enough to overcome Earth's gravity. So yeah, they have been in use for quite some time, but only on spacecraft that have already been put into space by the means of chemical engines. So we can't get rid of those yet. But when already in space, even weak thrust, but over long periods of time, can be useful. Here on Earth, if I drop, let's say, a ball, it falls and then quickly stops. It's affected by Earth's gravity and air resistance. If the ball is on the surface and I'll push it, it also stops because of friction. In space, though, in the ideal scenario, far from massive bodies, almost in a vacuum, 
If I push the ball, friction wouldn't stop it, and it would keep going in this direction basically forever, unless it collides with something, which is unlikely. And now imagine I push it not once, but I'll keep repeatedly giving it pushes for two years. It could become quite fast. Yes, it took the Dawn spacecraft four days to reach the velocity of only 100 kilometers or 60 miles per hour. But after accelerating for a very long time, it eventually became one of the fastest spacecraft ever launched. Electric thrusters have been used in space since 60s and 70s, but over the most of this period, they never were the main engines on spacecraft. They were only used for altitude control, to change the orientation, and so on. But as the main engine on the spacecraft, it was used only recently. In 1998, the experimental mission Deep Space One was first to use an ion drive as the main engine. The same N-star thruster that was later used on the Dawn spacecraft. And since, there have been more. Both Japanese spacecraft Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2, European spacecraft Solar Orbiter, and Bepi Colombo, which is now on its way to Mercury. These are its thrusters and they provide thrust of at least 250 million newtons. In my previous video, I talked about several types of spaceflight trajectories, and the simplest of which is home and transfer orbit. But in short, when we already overcame Earth's gravity to jump from the Earth's orbit around the Sun to an orbit of a different planet, let's say of Mars, using chemical thrusters, we need to perform two short but powerful impulses. One impulse to leave Earth's orbit and enter a transfer orbit, and the second is to leave the transfer orbit and enter the orbit of Mars. So we fire engines twice, and those two impulses use up most of the fuel. And what would the path of a spacecraft with an ion engine look like? Let's again look at the Dawn spacecraft. Dawn's trajectory is shown in blue with brown sections, and all that is blue is when spacecraft thrusters were on, and the dark sections are exaggerated. So it was thrusting most of the time and also had to perform a gravity assist at Mars. And it only had only 425 kilograms of xenon. In comparison, MRO spacecraft had to only reach Mars like this, and it had 1,187 kilograms of hydrazin, and 70% of which was used during a single maneuver of entering the orbit of Mars. Obviously, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but you get the point. Ion drives require less fuel, and the spacecraft can go farther. Less fuel means a cheaper mission and more room or mass for scientific instruments, and that we like. Ion thrusters allow more flexibility. Because ion drives were used on Dawn spacecraft, it still remains the only spacecraft that not just flew by, but orbited two bodies other than Earth, Ceres and Vesta. The next generation of NASA's ion thrusters is called, well, Next. It provides about 236 million newtons of thrust, it has higher specific impulse, longer lifespan, that is enough for a six-year mission. And there is already a spacecraft with those thrusters in space. I'm talking about DART mission. Psyche mission will use whole thrusters. And of course, it is also a work in progress, and engineers and scientists are trying to come up with some new variants of fuel. Let's say instead of xenon atoms, molecules of other materials, or thrusters that use water or iodine. And some satellites in lower Earth orbit can use gas from upper layers of Earth's atmosphere as fuel. It's not a lot of gas there, but it's there. It's called atmospheric breathing electric thrusters. That can help satellites stay in orbit longer. So it's safe to say that more and more spacecraft will explore the solar system using ion and other kinds of electric thrusters. Thanks for watching! Links to all of the sources are, as usual, down below in the description. And if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Bye!